All right, my people, there are issues with the Moad SF page, so we're going to do it right here. Very excited to have Natalie Bazil as my guest. I would show you the copy of her latest book, We Are Each Other's Harvest, Celebrating African-American Farmers, Land and Legacy. But my oldest daughter, hey, what's up, Kenji? Uh, what's up, Kabui? There she is. My oldest daughter has the copy of the book and uh, she won't give it back to me. So I'm going to invite Natalie in and we're going to chop it up. Look, while we're waiting for Natalie to uh, click in, I just want to introduce a couple books that I've been reading lately, um, books and journals. One is this journal, Radical, started by my friend um, Daryl, who, uh, as a Stanford graduate student, created this project, Earth and Color, which really recenters Black and Indigenous people <clears throat> um, when we're talking about, you know, land sovereignty, food justice, and... Um, this whole idea that Earth Day is somehow not applicable to black folks and other folks of color. Okay, let me try to get Natalie in again. Some of these tech glitches are stressing me out. All right, what else? If you're in the barbecue, Rodney Scott, one of the, um, hey, what's up, Natalie? Hey, can you see me? I see you well. Okay. Okay. Cool. I was just talking about a couple of books that I've been um, reading. I just want to give people some some game. So Rodney Scott's new barbecue book, he's one of the pit masters people love. Um, you're into that, support that brother. Okay. Supernatural Every Day, which is my friend Heidi Swanson's new book, Farm Fresh, Good Food on a Daily Basis. And then finally, um, Afro Nostalgia, Feeling Good in Contemporary Black Culture. Uh, very academic, but soulful and just what we need. So awesome. what's up, Natalie? How are you? Brian, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. It's so good. This, I mean, I don't know if we've seen each other in person <laughs> since you did that talk in my um, daughter's school, right? You know, one other time. Oh, no, at, we saw each other at Sundance. Yes, <laughs> at Sundance and at uh, Michelle Elam's and Harry Elam's dinner. Where true, you come. true. I, I, don't, I don't remember if that was before or after, but right around that same time. Yeah, yeah, no, I, you're right. I've been seeing you, um, not as often <laughs> as I was like, as I, I would like to see you, but yeah, I have seen you. Um, that was a fun party down in- um, That was fun. Redwood that City. That was good. Did you, Delicious you, food. You enjoyed the food? <laughs> I loved it. I'm still thinking about that food, honestly. Yes, still thinking yes. about that meal, it was delicious. Thank you, thank you. Well, we did it. We, um, that was like the official first non-official event for Vegetable Kingdom and, um, that's true. We we killed it last year. I don't know if you were, you were you aware that out of all the cookbooks that were published in the United States um, that made it on any list, you know, the best cookbooks of the year list. So they um, had a list that aggregated all of the lists in which books that appeared on there, um, you know, they ranked them. And Vegetable okay. Kingdom was the third highest ranking book of all no the kidding. books that came out last year. Uh, no kidding. You know, we won that NAACP Image Award. The book has sold extremely well. And um, I really believe that that beautiful energy with all those Black, brilliant folks down in Palo Alto, that, that just started <laughs> some beautiful momentum for the book. It so was. anyway. Fantastic. It's a beautiful book, Ryan. It's a beautiful book. So I'm not surprised. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, let's get into your new book. Before, before I do that, I, I want to thank our sponsor. Uh, Kaiser Permanente has been the underwriter of my residency at the Museum of the African Diaspora since it started in 2015. And, um, <clears throat> you know, they're just unwaveringly supportive of this mission that we have, because I think it's largely aligned with their mission um, yeah. of improving public health, you know, trying to help prevent chronic illnesses and not just respond to medical crises. So um, that's what we're about. And I... Um, was saying before I brought you in that my daughter, Fumilayo, my 10 year old, has been devouring your new book. <laughs> You're kidding! Yo, I love she, that. yeah, she is, she loves this book, all the stories. Um, 
Unfortunately, she's in Napa Valley for the weekend with the family, and so I don't have the book to show the people, but can you just show that beautiful cover, the, please? Yes. I have. So this is the cover. I don't know, position that. We are each other's harvest, celebrating African-American farmers' land and legacy. And uh, with the two phenomenal uh, Pennyman sisters on yes. the cover. Yes. They are amazing. Can, you, are can we talk amazing. about this cover? First of all, that cover is so fire, Natalie. <laughs> and I imagine that there are a lot of conversations about what the cover should be and, yeah. you know, looking at different image options. Can you talk about that process? I'm always... Um, thinking about just, you know, the mm -hmm. first touch that many people have with books and it's the cover. Mm -hmm. And that, that mm -hmm. one is, is just, I'm drawn in immediately. So I'd yeah. love to hear more about that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. So when I sent in the manuscript, uh, I actually sent in, when I had to send in my sample pages, um, I, I took some of the portraits from the book and I enlarged them so that they were full size so that the editor could get a sense of what I was trying to say with this book. And the book has both uh, modern contemporary portraits uh, and photography, but it also has archival, foot, uh, ar archival photos, you know, of black people, you know, involved in agriculture, farmers, beautiful photographs. And it really came down to two images. This one of Naima and uh, Leah, and then there was a really beautiful archival photo <clears throat> of a black man standing in this in a field uh, and it's unplowed and he's standing on like a, a wooden platform and he's you know he's being pulled along by these mules and it's a big open sky and it's a big open field it's captivating but and, and when the editors asked me which one I preferred I said we have to go with the Pennymans. We have mm. to go with the modern cover because this book is a celebration and it has to signal looking forward. It can't Ooh. just be looking backwards. Yes. And they, they trusted my, you know, what I had to say. And, and it's a cover that I think stops people in its tracks because it, it what it signals to me is you don't know everything, mm -hmm. right? The archival photo, it would be easy to pass by it and for people to say, okay, I, I think I know what that story is. Mm -hmm. But this is the future, right? Yep. It's, it's, it's the present and it's the future. And it's unapologetic and it is fierce. Yes. And that's what I wanted. Look, I, I so feel you on everything you just talked about because we went through a similar process when choosing the cover for my forthcoming book, Afro mm -hmm. uh, or a Black Food. And, mm -hmm. hey. you know, originally I had wanted to have an image of um, actually an altar to our heroine Edna Lewis oh. on the cover of the book. And I really felt like, you know, because she inspires so many of the young chefs and food creatives, that that image would speak to, you know, this whole idea of Sankofa kind of looking backwards as we move forward. Yeah. But then, we decided that it didn't make sense to have her on the cover. So we, we created this altar to ingredients throughout the Black diaspora. And it's a beautiful, it was a beautiful image, but it just felt like the past. It felt mm -hmm. like, you know, something that would draw in people of our generation, maybe a little younger, but I felt like we needed a riveting cover that would yeah. speak to the younger generation and speak yes. to the ethos of this book, which is about, you know, really, embracing what our lives look like when we don't have that. Um, as Toni Morrison says, you know, without racism, when we're not consumed with that racism, the albatross of white supremacy mm -hmm. around our necks. And so um, we went back to the drawing board and this is what we came up with. That's the cover of the book right See, there. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool, right? Yeah. It's, yep. you know, it, it, it's, and this is what I love about these books that are coming out. There, there is a, like a, a, something dynamic about these covers. I think of like the Black Futures cover too, right? Yep, yep. It's like, you don't know. You don't know. You have to, you have to engage with that book in order to find out what it's about. You can't mm -hmm. just dismiss it because the cover, you think you know what the cover says. So I love that yes. cover. I think that's so cool. Thank you, thank you. What's up, Tanya Holland? So for those of you, of, of you who are just chiming in, we are speaking with Natalie Bazil. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? I always yeah, think Bazil. I am, but 
Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie, I'm going to read you a bio uh, for those of you who might not be um, extremely familiar with Natalie's work. Natalie is the author of Queen Sugar, which has been adapted for a fifth television season by and co-produced by Ava DuVernay and Oprah Winfrey. Queen Sugar was named one of the San Francisco Chronicle's best books of 2014 and nominated for an NAACP Image Award. Her new nonfiction book is We Are Each Other's Harvest, um, Celebrating African-American Farmers' Land and Legacy. And Natalie's nonfiction work has appeared in National Geographic, Lenny Letter, The Bitter Southerner, O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, and numerous anthologies. Um, we are blessed to have Natalie as our neighbor here in Oakland, yeah. California. <laughs> so That's I remember right. you talking right. about this book. I actually, I feel like when you came to my kids' school, for the panel, mm -hmm. you were just closing that deal or you had just signed a book deal or it was kind of close to the embryonic stage or maybe just now, you know, just got a book. And so it's exciting to just see it in the physical um, form. But I'm wondering, can you talk about why you decided to make this your next book? You know, obviously, I think a lot of people see yeah. you as a novelist and, you know, see you as someone who does a lot of fiction writing. But I'm wondering what was the pivot for this particular project? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you froze up a little bit there, but I think I, I, I know your question. Um, oh, oh, I was just asking you about the pivot from, um, you know, Queen Sugar and the fiction writing to doing a nonfiction book that focuses on, um, you know, African-Americans in agriculture. Yeah. So um, Tracy Sherrod at Amistad reached out to me and she just said, you know, I would love to do a project with you. And her original pitch was like, you know, maybe we can do like some kind of TV tie-in book for the television show, Queen Sugar. And I, you know, I had to be honest with her. I was like, you know, I am not involved directly with the production. So if you are looking for a book that's gonna be like a behind the scenes look at the cast and the crew and that whole thing, I said, I can't deliver that book. And so mm -hmm. I was talking with my agent about this and she was actually the one who said, you know, if you could just think, just think, if you could do any book, what would you do? And when I thought about it, I thought, you know, in Queen Sugar, I told the story of black farmers through the lens of fiction. Mm -hmm. And, but, but now I really want, I want these farmers to be able to speak for themselves, right? And I want to be able to tell this bigger historical story about Black people's connection to the soil, the American soil. Mm. And, and, and it just felt like as much as I was at home at, at peace with Queen Sugar, and I totally was, I felt like there was still work to be done. But I wanted to do it through the lens of nonfiction so that I could kind of grapple with these same questions in this, in this movement that I sensed was underway with Queen Sugar and I knew it had picked up momentum. And so it was, this was just my attempt to, you know, get at all of these other issues. Um, that, that's really what started it. That, but mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't have a clear sense necessarily when I started. Like when I talked to you, Brian, uh, at, your, at your daughter's school, that was like the beginning and I had an inkling about what I wanted the book to be, but um, I didn't necessarily like have everything nailed down. I was still, I think, trying to mm -hmm. figure it out and follow my gut. Mm -hmm. So when did the book start to gel? When did you start to see the emerging story and get a sense of who you wanted to be a part of it and interview? Like, yeah. I, I, you know, part of these conversations, because I think there um, are people who are budding writers and food writers. And so um, I'm, I'm interested in process. Um, and so I'm just mm -hmm. wondering, like, you know, how did that start to unfold for you? Yeah. Well, you know, as I thought about this book, I knew I, I knew that it, it would have to, in addition to the narratives, in order to tell this story, I felt like it had to have these other elements in it. So like I knew I wanted to deal with the history, but I'm not a historian, right? And 
I knew that if I tried to just take on the history of Black people and the USDA and agriculture and all this kind of stuff, I could get bogged down in, in the writing of that. And in the meantime, I was reading these amazing articles uh, or sitting in on conversations with historians, right? And I thought, well, I'm going to get them to write because mm. that, these are their areas of expertise. So like I either reached out to historians and commissioned essays from them and gave them kind of maybe a general sense of what I was looking for, or I um, secured the rights to essays or articles that, are, that were addressing some of the, the issues that I was thinking about, right? Mm -hmm. But I also knew that I wanted this book to be art. I wanted it to be an, like an artistic, jubilant, celebratory, dynamic experience. And I know mm -hmm. that the things that excite me are like photography and poetry mm -hmm. and art. And, and, and so I thought, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that in too so that we are looking at these issues, but in a way that I felt would be more just engaging and dynamic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that no matter where you enter in the book, you are getting like a conversation or an interview or a, a fantastic poem by, you know, Robin Cost Lewis or Ross Gay or Elizabeth Alexander. Mm -hmm. it, it was the only way I could really do it, you know, once I really started to think about what I wanted this book to look and feel like. Yep. You know, it's funny. Um, I think about your project. I think about my forthcoming book. I think about Black Futures. And right. it's almost like there's this talk about these topics that could easily just be going the realm of, you know, heady and intellectual. But, you right. know, you, Kimberly, um, and um, me, other folks, I feel like are really thinking about how do you mm -hmm. translate the soulfulness and, and the, the kind of visceral. Exactly. Um, nature of this. Can you talk about some of the themes that you thought it was important to cover in, in the book? Um, well, yeah. So, of course, I wanted to address, like, some of the issues around why Black people have lost land, right, over the generations. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a larger question there about intergenerational wealth and, and how Black people have, have, have this rich history of being connected to the land that goes all the way back to our, you know, roots on the African continent, right? Mm -hmm. But how, how, because of, you know, in large part, a history of uh, racial violence and discrimination and terror, we have been uh, systematically separated from this rich agricultural history to, to, mm -hmm. to some extent. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about that. But I also wanted to talk about food, right? Mm -hmm. And so like I wanted there to be food essays in the book to to talk about the rich culinary traditions that we have and and you know that that seemed important to me. And I wanted to talk about family and I wanted to talk about just <clears throat> immigration, right? I mean, so many issues that are kind of rooted in land and land stewardship, but kind of ripple out to these larger questions about the, the artistry of farming and the creativity of it. And mm. these farmers who you don't think of, right? When we think of the American farmer, we think of a white guy, right? Mm -hmm. And I was saying, no, there are third, fourth, fifth, sixth generations of black people. Mm -hmm. who are still doing this work. And then you have this whole new wave of young people who are reconnecting to the soil through the lens of activism and community. And it just was so rich, Bryant. And I just was all of that. A little bit of, you know, stuff about queen sugar, right? There's, uh, there, there's some queen sugar stuff in there too.
Can you see me? I yeah. don't know if you can see me. I do. You froze up for a second. Can you see me? Okay. Okay. Can you see me, Natalie? I can see you. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's um, a little, yeah I can see you. Let me okay. see, let me try something. Is that better, Natalie? That's that's I think that's better. Okay, cool. Uh yeah, <laughs> like, maybe not <laughs> freezing, but <laughs> Yeah, I'm these I'm I'm so fatigued of Zoom, FaceTime, IG I lives. I, I just I need in person contact <laughs> I totally and agree. just like <laughs> I, I'm over this. I totally but, agree. Yeah. But um so I know you have some agrarian roots in the South and Louisiana in particular. And I'm wondering um, yeah. if your your own family's history inspired part of this story and, and just your thoughts about how you wanted to approach mm -hmm. this work. Yeah. Well, you know, I do have agrarian roots actually on both sides of my family. And <laughs> what influenced me more for this book was learning that on my mother's side, um, my great-great-grandfather, Mac Hall, who was born in 1845 and came over on one of the last slave ships, not Clotilde, but one, a, another later one, mm -hmm. um, he ended up being, after emancipation, he acquired over time about 640 acres of land and was a farmer in Georgiana, Alabama. And mm -hmm. so learning that and learning that I literally have, you know, farming in my background and thinking mm -hmm. about how that connection to the land really was passed down on my mother's side. Um, that really got me thinking about how I, why I would even be drawn to this subject matter. Um, mm -hmm. Like for years, you know, why it was part of Queen Sugar and why I would want to explore it now. So, yeah, I, I have that connection. Mm -hmm. If this is too personal, um, feel free to, you know, we can skip over it. But, you know, when I think about okay. my own practices in creating, um, I mean, particularly book projects, but even beyond that, um, and, and specifically with Black food, I was doing a lot of um, very intentional practices to connect with my ancestors and both blood mm -hmm. ancestors who have a similar history of, you know, agrarian roots, being smallholder farmers in the rural South, um, but also just these blood ancestors or spiritual ancestors that deeply um, inspire my work, like Edna Lewis. I'm wondering, do you have any practices that help you tap into, you know, just the unseen, mm -hmm. you know, just listening, mm -hmm. hearing um, mm -hmm. whomever speaking yeah. to you. Yeah. 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 You know, okay, so it's interesting. So right around the time, and I just made this connection the other day. So right around the time I um, was starting this book project, I went to see a like a priestess, right, who connected with my ancestors. And I was just open. I was like, I'm going to do this thing and see what comes up. Mm -hmm. And she was talking. It was this whole ceremony, right, where she was like libations and all this kind of stuff. And when she came back to me, she said, your people are a land-based people, right? And it was crazy because I actually, you know who it is? You know, Cher, um, um, Sarah Kernan of Miss Ollie's. Of course, yep. It was her. And I first, I first ran into Sarah at a mutual friend's wedding. And I swear to you, Brian, out of the blue, I'd never met her before, but she was at the wedding and she was doing the ceremony. And she turned to me and she said, I have a message to, for you from your ancestors. And I was like, okay, <laughs> yes, yes. And so 
when we met and she went through this ceremony, she said to me, you are from a land-based people. And, you know, she talked about my mother's side of the family and she actually gave me a, a, a bowl of cotton that I have up in my writing office. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of, you know, stayed in touch with that as I was writing the book. And then the other thing that happened so my dad passed away in 2011 mm -hmm. and he was a, he used to grow collard greens, right? In, in our backyard in LA, he had this, mm -hmm. he had his garden. My mother had the garden, but then he had his own collard green patch. And when he passed away, <clears throat> my mother harvested some of the seeds from his collard greens mm -hmm. and mailed them to me in an envelope. And I have had, and they were seeds that he got from some old black man somewhere in LA, right? So the, it's almost like Jack and the Beanstalk kind of seeds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I held on, on to those, and have planted some so that I feel like I have my dad who, you know, I felt mm. kind of helped me channel, you know, a lot of the Queen Sugar stuff. So on these both sides of my family, I have this connection and I'm, I'm not questioning it. I'm just going with it. I'm just going with it. That's beautiful. But it's crazy. You would, it's interesting you would ask that question. Yeah. You know, when you mentioned the, the collard greens and the seeds, it reminded me of a conversation that I had with one of the contributors to the new book. You know, I um, either commissioned or licensed the, the different uh, fine artists to offer pieces mm. that would open up each chapter. And for the um, the first chapter, Prologue, Spirit, uh, I, I knew that this artist, Daniel Minter, this uh, Brooklyn-born Maine-based artist was the person to do it because I have a couple of his books. He has this really beautiful book about um, Black midwives. And mm. I think one of the things he does so well is as an artist, he skillfully captures the unseen. Like you get a sense of like the spirits and the ancestors in his work. And so he does these layered works and a lot of them have our ancestral foods. And he talked to me, he's an Ifa priest. Mm. And he talked to me about just this, the, the sanctity of many of our ingredients. And he was just like, you know what? You don't even need to do anything with them. Just keep them around. Keep okra yeah. in your office. Keep collards yeah. in your office. Keep these foods that have sustained our people over generations and across seas. Keep them around. And when you talked yeah. about your um, the seeds, I was just like... It just made me think about that, you know, just connecting us. So, um, yeah, yeah. I want I've, some of I've, those collards. I will give you some of the seeds. <laughs> I will give you some of the seeds. I've got a whole, I've got a little envelope of them. And okay. uh, I just keep them tacked on my bulletin board. And they were there, Bryant, for what? That was 2011. Mm -hmm. And I planted them this winter. That is 10 years that those seeds have been tacked on my bulletin board and they're growing. I have a little pot of them outside in my yard now. So it's crazy. It's crazy. But there's something there, I think. Do you, when I, I first got the book, I sat with it, but it's been a while. Um, so I don't remember this, but you know, I know that there are lots of conversations about the corporate control of seeds, the patenting of seeds. Um, I'm wondering, do you have, um, essays in the book or, you know, anything that speaks to, you know, our traditional food ways and just like holding on to like these crops and seeds um, and just kind of ensuring that the, the biodiversity that might have been seen like a, a century ago, we can continue to pass mm -hmm. these things down to um, future yeah. generations. Yeah, you know, probably the, the, the one essay that, that speaks to that is uh, from Michael Twitty. And he wrote this beautiful essay, prose poem <clears throat> called, um, what is that? It's called like a lesson. It's called uh, a remembering. Hold on, let me look at the title. Mm -hmm. uh, Everyone beneath their own vine and fig tree, a, a remembering in seven parts. Hmm. And it is just this really lyrical meditation on, on, our connection to, you know, seeds and bringing them over and the vision that, uh, you know, our ancestors had, right? And actually that begins the book. And then the last 
thing in the book is a, one of the last things is a poem. The last poem is from Naima Pennyman. Mm. And again, it is this gorgeous um, meditation on what it took for our ancestors to have just that glimmer of hope, right? As they were boarding those ships to bring these seeds over. And, it, and the last line of it is, is like, hold on, let me see. So it reads, we are descendants of futurists who did not give up on the possibility at least one seed would survive. Mm. The endless tides and transatlantic crossings, auction blocks, monocrop cotton, razor sharp sugar, the harvest of salt, the scalding sun and burning crosses hidden propagation in forbidden gardens, generations of dehydration and bondage, mm. summoning softness from the clouds, our bodies are made of water and promise. Our mothers, mothers, mothers did not give up on the possibility that, one, that at least one seed would make its way through layers of cold, hard, rocky silt and sand and clay. And in the face of great danger, soften its shells, open its hull, extend a tender root, find water and food, trusting there is light somewhere enough to bloom. A flower becomes fruit. Love precedes a child. Someone was dreaming of you. I get, Ooh, and, right? Wow. <laughs> I'm like, damn, both yes. those sisters can write. <laughs> They're just like on it, you know? And I love having that I love having that poem from Naima because it really, you know, it's in conversation with Michael Twitty's essay at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and that's that's what I was trying to capture is this the the wonder and the the dignity and the vision and the foresight, right? Of our people. Mm -hmm. Beautiful book so, in. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you could share some lessons that you might have gleaned, some best practices, some stories that you can mm -hmm. share to inspire us. Because I think that, um, you know, we're in a moment where a lot of people are just feeling. Yeah. I'm having a lot of feelings and I know a lot of my people yeah. are having feelings and I've just been trying to one, just focus on my own personal joy and also yeah. really keep at least one eye on just creation. And, and what does it mean when we're in our magic and our power and our agency and um, just constantly thinking about the future that we want to manifest. So yeah. I'm hoping that yeah. you can share some things that uh, might inspire us. Yeah. Um, I mean, I totally feel you, you know, I, I feel that. Um, and I think in a, in a general sense, what I was trying to offer in this book is hope and is celebration, right? And so when I think about the stories in the book, I think about, <laughs> um, God, I mean, so many of them. Um, I think about the Bluefords in South Carolina, right? They are fourth generation. It's a son and uh, Mr. Bluford and his three sons, right? And they tell this story in the book. O'Neill tells a story in his portion. He's the oldest son. And he talks about how, you know, his grandfather bought him this tractor, right? When he was a little kid hmm. and how he really felt like his grandfather saw something in him and wanted to like give him this gift. He really felt anointed in, 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 as a kid to mm -hmm. do this work. And then when I was talking to his brothers about why they farm, right? Given all the challenges with climate change and all the rest, they said they really do it for family because they feel like at the end of the day, they are so blessed to be able to wake up every day and mm. work with the people they love the most, you know? 
even when it's hard, even when there's, you know, a little bit of sibling rivalry, whatever, mm -hmm. they would do it again because first of all, they're young and they understand uh, what their role is, right? People all over their community come to them for advice. Mm -hmm. So there's a level of expertise there, right? And they're young guys. They're like in their 20s, 30s. And I think O'Neill, maybe he's 42, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they are carrying the, the, they understand that they are carrying this <coughs> ball forward. Mm -hmm. And it's just an up, uplifting story. I think about um, Melanie Edwards, who is this young woman who I, met when I, uh, she invited me up to Alaska, where she was in farm school, right? Alaska, of all places. Mm. And she has a vision for, like, raising sheep. And, but she learned on this farm to, like, do everything from, like, iron work to laying pipe to fixing engines mm. to building a log cabin, right? Wow. And it's just so inspiring to see that there are black people all over the place doing this mm -hmm. work and they understand they understand the legacy right they see themselves carrying this ball forward and mm -hmm. they bring such creativity to this and such in ingenuity i think about a young guy uh kamal bell um he has this farm, Sankofa Farms, in North Carolina, outside of mm -hmm. Durham. Mm -hmm. And he is, a, he is a farmer and a beekeeper, right? Mm -hmm. and, and works with young Black men, specifically young Black men from Durham. He brings them out to his farm, trains them how to work with agriculture, teaches them about science, teaches mm -hmm. them, you know, all of this stuff. And then these young guys are beekeepers, right? So it's all about shifting the narrative about who we think of when we think about mm -hmm. farmers, what we th how we define success, right? Yep. How we change the conversation <clears throat> about labor and what it means to have your hands in the soil, right? All of that. Is, is, is part of what I was trying to capture in this book, in addition to, you know, thanking the ancestors and all that over my shoulder, right? Mm -hmm. But it really is about a vision for moving forward. And when you read these stories of these, uh, just this diversity of, of people, and unfortunately, I didn't get to talk to as many people as I wanted to because I had to turn in the manuscript, right? So there yeah. are voices in this there are people I've met since who I would love to have included, but I think people are finding it to be an uplifting reading experience because it is really meant to be a celebration mm -hmm. and it's meant to be an affirmation, right? Yes. Of yep. who we are as black people and, and our resilience sometimes in the face of, you know, unspeakable tragedy, but also resilience because there is something about our experience that 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 is like a wonder, right? And mm -hmm. it's and it's about community and carrying yeah. us forward. So, you know, and I think the poetry helps. <laughs> you know, For the sure. poetry and, and 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 some of the other conversations, whether it's. Uh, I interviewed one of the Queen Sugar writers, right? Hmm. Who, uh, his name is Jason Wilborn. And he, he and I got to be friends when I visited the Queen Sugar set uh, during season one. And we just kind of bonded because, you know, we both went to Berkeley, we both were writers. But when I interviewed him, what Jason revealed is how much of his personal family history he brought to the writing of Queen Sugar, right? He has mm -hmm. farmers, his grandfather was a farmer. Mm -hmm. And so I think just the diversity of voices in this book, um, the diversity of experiences in this book um, allows people to see that it's not just one thing, 
right? Mm -hmm. It's not just one thing. So that's a long answer to your question. But <laughs> no, that was the perfect answer. And I feel so inspired just hearing you recount some of these uh, moving stories, because, you know, I often talk about the need for us to move beyond just personal uh, consumer action as a way to transform our food system, because I think a lot of people, you know, and I, I'm glad that people are thinking more about shopping locally and, you know, going to the farmer's market and getting fair trade products and, and all mm -hmm. that. But I think for too long, people have been convinced that consumer, consumer action is enough. If I just spend my money in alignment with my values, we're good. And yeah. then, you know, over the years, especially when I first started doing this work, I would talk a lot about the need for us to be activist community members and supporting existing organizations that are doing this work. And then also being, um, using our voice as citizens and ensuring yes. that the people that we're electing and putting in office, they're making decisions in the best interest of small farmers, of people living yes. in low-income um, urban centers and neighborhoods that are often described as food deserts. But what I've been thinking about a lot over the past, especially the past year, we got to create our parallel institutions. If we've learned nothing over the past year, this government cares little about us. Capitalism definitely doesn't care about us. And yeah we have to create our own institutions in which we can care for each other, in which we can, you know, just continue to build these legacies that we can pass down. And so um, I I'm really hoping that this book will inspire people who aren't thinking in that spirit um, because we got to do it. I was just like, yeah. <laughs> we got to do for self. We got to be self-determined yes. because nobody's yes. going to save us but us, as they say. Yes. So. yes. That that's totally true. And you know, I, I appreciate that, Bryant, because that speaks again to the title of this book, right? The title of this book, We Are Each Other's Harvest, comes from the last lines of a Gwendolyn Brooks poem uh, called Paul Robeson. And the last stanza of this poem says, and it's the epigraph in the book, it says, we are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond, right? Which is all about taking care of each other and mm -hmm. moving forward together. And, and we are each other's business, right? We, it's about collectivity, right? Yep. It's, mm -hmm. about, it's about recognizing our humanity, celebrating that, um, I dare say, you know, it has a note of, of uh, being unapologetic, which I also appreciated about so many of the farmers in the book. They're not waiting. They're not mm -hmm. waiting for anything. Mm -hmm. They are doing, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and, and so to me that the, the title has such force behind it. You know, it's so affirming. It's so self-affirming. Yep. Yes. And I just... I just love that. I love it. So. so we are in the earliest stages of planning a Black Food Summit at Moad for the fall. Oh and oh um, I, I already, I got to have you <laughs> something. You got something or some things. We need to have you be a part of this. I would love okay. for you to, um, you know, we can set up a book signing. Uh, let's talk about how we can yeah, just kind of sure. really do it big sure. and, and celebrate your book and have you yeah. be present. Any, I, right? I'm, I'm there. What, whatever you need, <laughs> you have my full support. Happy to for do sure. it. Happy to do Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Natalie, thank you so yes. much for taking time to chop it up with You're us. Um, you know, Moad is a big supporter of your work across the board. Uh, I do want people to know that you can order Natalie's book through the Moad uh, bookstore online. So check out our website, go through the bookstore, support black museums, support black booksellers. And um, yeah, I don't know if you have any final Amazing. notes, but um, look forward to seeing you, you in know, person. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. In person. I'm mm -hmm. vaccinated. So say the word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. All right. Listen, okay. have a great weekend, Brian, Natalie, so and um, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody, for um, chiming in.